Hey, Tim. Yep, hello, sir. So yeah, I just I just started this early to help some of the visitors. So I'm just uh, prepping the the agenda until then. Is that cool? No, oh, yeah, absolutely. I'll just continue to work here. <laughs> Great. Hey, Michaela. Hi there. I can't see you, but wait. Cannot? Can. No, cannot. Can you see me? Yep, we can see you. All right. Give me one second. See us? Any better? See us? <laughs> okay. Oh, I can't see Good. you yet. But I'm working Good. with it. Cool. Yes. All right. Okay, I got you. Good. Are you on Linux? Yes, yes. No, but on the problem, okay. I was on, uh, 
I was on the, on the, another screen, so my screen was completely uh, wrong, the size of the screen. Now I can see everything. It's just okay, great. resetting the screen. That's all. Good, good. All right. Well, people should be joining here in the next 10 minutes. I'm still uh, prepping the, the agenda, so uh, so uh, give, me, uh, give me 10, and I think then we'll get rolling. But uh, good to see you. Yeah, sure. I'll have you uh, introduce yourself to the rest of the group here uh, at the beginning. Okay. What are you doing? Are you happy with the, you happy with the hangout? I'm trying to see what was the lag between the camera and the, and the video streaming. It's not that bad. It's not that bad, I have to say. You should try, you should try pressing that little dog button. You'll have some real fun then. <laughs> nice trick, you. Nice trick. Oh, my gosh. I you stop this? <laughs> okay. Good.
Hey, Josh, are you there? Hey. How's it going? Do you see us? I can see you. Hold on, I'll turn my camera on. Hey. How's it going? Good. Good to see you. Good to see you guys. All right, so we're about four minutes from the start, and um, uh, we're going to have a round of introductions once everybody gets in. So uh, cool. I think I'll, so. Uh, looks like your the technical part checks out. So we'll uh, um, give me a few minutes then, and we'll we'll get started. Okay. Sounds good. Great. Hello. Hey, Borg. How's it going? Good. Good. Excellent. I got a few uh, few new folks here. Josh, you might want to mute when you're not talking because we can hear your keys going. Clack, 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 clack. Oh, you can. Yeah. All right, so we're getting folks in here. <clears throat> All right, folks, joining a bit. Hello, Velast. Oh, can you hear us? Velast? Oh. Nope, poke. I don't think you can hear us. All the new, all the visitors are um, extremely prompt, and everyone else is uh, going to make their way in here in a minute. No, but that's good. To testing it, to test it out. Okay. Supposedly somewhere there's Mike. Hey, so when hey guys, so when I hit docs, I've uh, tried to share the um, the agenda today. Um, try hitting docs and seeing if you see an agenda document link there or not. Hello. Hey, Joe. Hi, everyone. Hello. Uh, looks like it does work. Awesome. 
does. Hello, Mike. Let's see, maybe some technical issues. What is the agenda? Oh, there we go. Click the Docs button next to the little dog. Yeah. yeah. And no, uh, so I can't find which, which folder. Well, it should it should just be linked here in the Hangout. Uh, and then once you open it, because um, it's like it's it's publicly available, but um, it'll show up in your in your drop down list once you. Um, seen it for the first time, pretty sure. <coughs> All right, gotcha. Got it? Okay, great. Hi, Mike. Can you hear us? I, I haven't heard Mike yet, so. Hey, Alex. Hi, hey guys. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight. A few more slides. Okay, one more slot. Hey, Andre. Excellent. Okay. Is Stephen frozen now? Yeah. Unless it's... Uh, there we go. <laughs> uh, it's back. <laughs> Again. Okay. They're freezing, Stephen. <laughs> and we are the posters. Uh, Tim, are you frozen as well? No, nope, you're moving. <laughs> I think it's struggling to handle it. Okay, so we're at 10. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Yeah. So, Joe, um, for, for meeting purposes, can you, uh, can you switch to the stream for now, and then we'll start. Okay. I'm dropping. Sorry. <laughs> we'll just, we'll, we'll miss Sergey. otherwise. Technical problems. Mike again. Let's see. My person, Sergey. Yeah. 
Yeah. So that's be the last person we're missing. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Yeah. And Mateo is also watching on the live stream, as I mentioned on the on the uh, on the email. So I may swap out and swap swap in for those guys. Uh, let's see. Hello. Okay. Aha! Hi, Mike. We can hear you. It's loud and noisy. Um, I think there's some sort of feedback or something actually on your end. Hi. Can anyone hear me? Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes, we hear you. Can you hear us? <laughs> I'm just thinking, is technology great? <laughs> <laughs> hey, we're, we're almost doing a 10-person hangout quite well <laughs> across continents yeah. and states and all that. So there's, there's always a few technical challenges the first time. <laughs> <laughs> it was mine. All right, we should probably get started here since we do have a lot to get through. However, it's going to be a little tricky to do the introductions. Um, I think uh, without some of the audio things working, but but we can get started. Okay. So for those of you who haven't clicked on the docs button next to the little dog face, um, go ahead and do that. At, there should be an agenda for today. Um, there are some updates, and then we'll go ahead and go into the next uh, into the next section. Uh, before we get started, want to um, welcome some new visitors here to the to the meeting. Hello, Mike. Can we hear you? Hello. Can you hear me now? All right, we can hear you. Fantastic. Yep. Yep. Um, so um, let's see. If we have um, we have some folks in order, but we should probably go by order in, in technical. So um, let's see. Balash, are you there? Can you can you hear us? Yes, yes, I can hear you. Can ah, you hear me? Perfect. Yes, that's great. Okay, cool. Okay, so so let's go ahead and get started. So welcome everybody. Um, like I mentioned, this is a, a rather unusually large hangout. So we're usually at about eight, I think. Um, but um, after the meeting, the Normal meeting and the Brainscales meeting in Edinburgh this last week, we. Uh, picked up some other interested folks uh, who wanted to stop, stop by, and so I thought maybe we should just bring them all here. So well, we've added uh, 30 minutes to this meeting to enable um, to enable us to have the ability to do a few introductions and uh, and uh, have everybody meet everybody. So um, uh, and, and some of you have already seen signs of some folks and others others not. So Balash, uh, I think several of you saw his proposal. Um, so maybe we should just go ahead and, and get started with Balash. Why don't you just introduce yourself, explain to us uh, uh, your background, explain to us uh, how you found the project, and uh, what you're interested in doing next. Okay, so uh, just very quickly, uh, I have a background in physics. Uh, I did a four-year master's course there uh, in theoretical physics. However, I, I decided to give up that interest and I came into neuroscience and I'm just a first year student at the Neuroinformatics DTC up here in Edinburgh. And uh, I became interested in C. elegans for various reasons and I was just searching around on Google and that's when I found the uh, OpenWorm project and I found this is something really interesting. For me, what would be uh, sort of the, the, the goal of this project and I'm not sure if everybody is thinking uh, the same way about this is that, um, so as far as I'm concerned, the, the behavior of the worm itself is, is not very interesting. It, you can actually do pretty easily some statistical descriptions of it. But if open worm can reproduce these statistical regularities uh, as an emergent phenomena so that we really model the biology and then really the same things come out of it as for the real worm, I think that would be a, a really big achievement. If, 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 it can, if we can make it uh, with a strong biological basis. 
Um, last week I visited uh, Natal Cohen's lab down in Leeds. Uh, if I'm sure that some of you uh, know her already. She's working on C. elegans for 10 years now. She's got a quite big research group down in Leeds. And also Dr. Ian Hope is working down there who is an expert in uh, C. elegans microbiology and he just knows, uh, well I had the impression that he knows everything about C. elegans. Um, genetics. Uh, so it was a pretty good meeting. Uh, most likely I will be able to start my research in May and uh, well if you have read the proposal then roughly know what I would like to do but uh, sort of uh, I, I don't want to right now go into the details. I think we should go ahead with the other introductions but that's just that's very quickly about me but uh, I'm happy to talk about it more in detail as what I plan to do but Maybe, uh, I don't know, Stephen, shall we go with the other new people for the introduction or? Yeah, I think that's, that makes sense. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, good introduction. And, and just remind us, where did you, where did you do your work in, in physics, geographically? Well, uh, sorry, say again, I didn't hear you. Where did you do your work in physics? Oh, down in London at Imperial College. Okay, cool. Great. So, yeah, so let's, let's move on. So, Mike, uh, would you like introduce yourself? <coughs> yeah, sure. So uh, I'm Mike. I've got a background in physics also and now I'm doing a PhD in computational neuroscience in Cambridge. Um, so what I work on is multi-compartmental models, so detailed models of single cells. And one problem I faced is um, just how you go about optimi making, you know, optimizing these models. They've got tons of parameters and it's a, it's a pretty classical problem which is attracting a lot of interest at the moment. So I set about working on my own sort of optimization framework, but what I'd really like is to produce a tool for people who work on similar things, um, you know, who need to do optim optimization of these models to um, just have a tool that they could really easily use and, and so forth. And Well, I met uh, Steve at the uh, Code Jam in Edinburgh lo last week and um, so it turned out that this is something that, that um, the Open Worm project is, in, is interested in, you know, optimization of, of these multi-compartment models. So I thought it would be fantastic if wh what I've been working on for the past year, this, um, you know, using genetic algorithms to optimize models could integrate with the Open Worm project. And, uh, yeah. Excellent. Um, and so Alex, who's uh, at least on my screen all the way at the left, is uh, the mm -hmm. person who has been doing the optimization up until now. And so Alex, hopefully this is uh, this will be a, a good way for us to you know get some energy around uh, some of the genetic algorithm stuff and move, okay. move even farther than we are already. Um, so there you go. So great. Thank, thank you. Um, and Michele, would you like to introduce yourself? All right. Uh, hello everybody, my name is Michele. Uh, I have pretty much completed a PhD here in uh, DBI in Cambridge and uh, I also work in multi-compartmental model and a multi-scale modeling. And so I was really um, like uh, thrilled by the idea of doing this uh, massive model of the world's C. elegant. And uh, yeah, met, I mean, new students before, met also Giovanni and um, uh, I think Matteo as well, but it's not here, like uh, Kojan, so they say, like, uh, you know, we're going to go ahead with this uh, model and see uh, how we go ahead, and I said, well, you know, I have some some ideas, about some some skills, maybe it could be useful somehow, so I just want to see what I can be used to do something, because I found it's really interesting. Awesome. Excellent. Welcome. And uh, and then Josh, would you like to introduce yourself a little bit? Hey, uh, Josh, I'm a friend of Steven in San Diego. We're in the startup leadership program together, and uh, I'm not a neuroscientist, but <laughs> I work, I work um, in mostly in online marketing. So I'm working with other companies on that, and Steven had told me about some of his ideas to to raise some money and do some marketing, and you guys had open warm up and. Um, Big part of what I do is SEO, so I was explaining to him that, hey, you got to start ranking for your name before you start trying to go and get fundraising and that stuff. Because if, if you tell me um, 
I'm part of the Open Worm project and I go look for it and I don't find it really quickly, or the specific website, then you're going to be making conversion harder for yourselves in terms of raising money or whatever. That's all. Great. So thanks for thanks for being able to join us. So Josh, this meeting is uh, is a two hour meeting, where we're probably going to go a lot of the technical stuff. So maybe we can try and maybe you can just try and outline some of your stuff here at the beginning, uh, um, because it might not all be relevant to you. Although you're welcome to you're welcome to stay as long as you like, of course. But um, I think your piece is a pretty focused piece on on some suggestions for for the website, right? Right. Yeah. Okay. Great. So if you've got an idea of kind of what you're going to say, maybe it's I just want to prepare a couple comments, and we can go into that um, in a little bit. Okay. okay. So then, um, maybe the other, the, the rest of the folks who are here. So, by the way, so um, Michaela mentioned Matteo and Giovanni. So they are here. They're just watching the live stream, um, but they're just not present because uh, we're at the max of uh, the number of people. And actually, although I guess since Sergey hasn't joined us, maybe it makes sense for. Uh, one of you guys to actually pop back in real quick, um, and then um, if I hear something from uh, if I hear something from Sergey, maybe we'll swap swap that spot out. But uh, I think it makes sense for you guys to come back in, or one of you. Okay. Uh, um, so if the rest of the folks just want to introduce yourselves, because uh, um, the visitors don't know you all, um, I think that'd be good as well. So uh, maybe Tim, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure, I'm Tim Buskus, and um, basically, uh, oh, I think you're still to the project of the beat. Can you hear me? Yep. Sorry, I think it was just a delay. Okay. Yeah. So, I'm a computer scientist, and uh, basically came in the project at the beginning. But I have a, a neuroscience background to some degree. So, basically, I've been kind of working on the project from figuring out the neuroscience and then bringing it in to do the project and, and, and um, that's, that's what I've been doing. Great. Uh, Alex? Sure. Um, my background is mathematics, uh, basically. I started to work with the worm during my BA in Novosibir State University. And then I moved to uh, Central European University in Budapest. Uh, I started different things there, but now I went back and uh, continued the WARM project. Uh, uh, my part is the genetic algorithms um, and trying to tune the unknown parameters in a neural model. So that's the basic thing. Great. Andre? Okay. Uh, my name is uh, Andrei Polyev. Um, I'm from Novosibirsk, Russia. Um, I work together with uh, Alex, uh, who has um, uh, told about himself before, and uh, Sergei Khairulin, who is not at this meeting, as I see. Um, so we are a small group which uh, started to work in, on Serigan's simulation uh, in 2007 uh, year. Uh, and, um, well, our result um, before we uh, joined uh, Open Worm uh, group was so-called uh, cyber elegance, um, um, the elegance model, um, which you can find on Open Worm uh, site, um, which is based on uh, me mechanical uh, physical model. Uh, point masses, springs, uh, which can uh, contract um, when uh, neurons uh, activate them and so on. So something uh, quite primitive but uh, working. And this was the first step to a more complex uh, model, which we are going to develop um, working in Open World project. So I'm, I have finished uh, or defended my PhD uh, in 200, 2008, so about four years ago, um, and it was um, devoted to molecular uh, dynamics simulations uh, for protein folding, 
and my previous works were also um, connected with uh, computational models, biophysics, and some living systems. So, um, and uh, I find uh, Seligans one of the most exciting uh, objects in this field. And I'm not a specialist in neuroscience, but I like it very much. Great. Excellent. So, and um, I'd like to add that uh, now um, I'm working on implementation of a physics engine in the Open Worm project. Uh, we have uh, good success in um, single uh, CPU version, but um, as we need uh, more particles and more um, computational uh, power, uh, now we are using um, powerful uh, GPU devices. Uh, for example, we have in our lab two uh, cards uh, Tesla. Uh, then, uh, oh, oh I, I forget, um, uh, not the last generation, but um, quite good. So, last few months, uh, I was focused on moving our single CPU uh, physics to uh, parallel uh, GPU uh, version. And, well, we also have success in this direction, too. Sorry for being so long. <laughs> that is all for me. Thanks for listening. That's all. No worries. No worries. So Alex and Andre are in Novosibirsk, and Tim is in Los Angeles. Um, Joe, do you want to introduce yourself? Yes. Uh, okay. Most of the people already know, so I'll be brief. My background is uh, software engineering. I have a degree in electric, electrical engineering, and then a master's in software engineering, and then basically joined the project because I was interested in neuroscience, and it's a way for me to learn to kind of follow my uh, passions. And in the project, I am um, basically working mainly around the software engineering architecture in, th in terms of software engineering. And uh, jack of all trades, master of your own. <laughs> basically, where, wherever the stuff to do, I go and uh, try to learn as much as I can about the biological and neuroscience uh, implication of the project. And uh, that's pretty much me. I met some of you guys uh, in Edinburgh uh, last week. So it's good to see you here. And uh, I'd say that that's everything for me. Great. And, and Port? Muted. We can't hear you. Uh, hey, sorry, I'm Boric Leeson, I'm based in University College London at the moment, uh, based in an experimental and uh, computational neuroscience lab, uh, but my main work is all uh, computational, um, mainly working on uh, infrastructure for making it easier to build um, computational models. Part of that work is de uh, developing um, NeuroML, which is a common language between multiple simulators for um, expressing different parts of these types of models and thankfully the uh, CLGIMS guys have decided, to, or the OpenWorm guys have decided to use NeuroML for large components of the um, model. Um, I'm also uh, the main developer behind NeuroConstruct which is a graphical interface for handling these type of models and some, uh, you might have seen some of the images of uh, the CLGIMS which have been Im imported in NeuroML I converted from the Blender files into NeuroML and loaded into NeuroConstruct, and I'm slowly trying to work to uh, get those into more realistic models, which can be run on Neuron and hopefully the new uh, simulation engine being developed here. Okay, great. So now we've done all the introductions. I think um, I think we'll get Matteo in a little bit later. Um, like I said, he's watching a live stream. I think he's over in Cork now, so he'll be showing up and maybe Giovanni stream a little bit later. Um, and then um, I've sent a note up to Sergey if he wants to join in. Um, we'll swap out and uh, and have you guys do the introductions as well. But um, so great. So thanks everybody for joining us. Um, um, new and and old. Um, so I just wanted to give a few updates on the project. Um, 
a lot happened in the last sprint, um, partially um, partially the work that you all have been doing separately, but uh, also myself, Giovanni Matteo, were able to get together at this meeting that uh, we've alluded to, um, made some progress, and so the next bullet on the updates is the Worm Browser, um, which we tried to not launch um, a couple days ago before you guys saw it, but uh, the word kind of ended up getting out after we um, after we posted anyway. So it's um, so if you have a Chrome or new Firefox browser and you click on that, you should be able to see uh, something quite nice. Uh, I think several of you have probably already seen it and checked it out. I think I've got comments from several of you, but that's uh, kind of a um, an exciting development. Um, and it was good because we kind of waited until the last sprint of this release to do a lot on the web browser side. Um, but the fact that we got that out, I think, was, is really exciting. So um, it's also, we also decided to put up the code on GitHub, which makes this our first uh, GitHub project. Um, for lots of recommended reasons, um, we think that GitHub might be a good place to uh, be putting things. So a point of discussion for later is, is uh, you know to what extent we should be 100% on GitHub um, versus spread out between Google Code and, and GitHub. But um, do you guys have any do you guys have any comments that you want to say here just on the stream about the uh, about the browser or questions and or concerns or things that need to be fixed? It actually has been That's updated great. since yesterday. So. How can I see it? There's so a link in the chat. there's a link in the chat and there's a link and a live link on the. Um, okay, on the I see it. It takes a while to come up. Okay, got it. Cool, thank you. <laughs> yeah, no problem. Um, so, that's amazing. This is cool. That's a lot of fun. Can anybody not see it? Does anybody have any technical problems checking it out? Well, Ash, do you see it? Yeah, it looks really cool. So just as the the history of this is that you know we've wanted in the project to do something like this for a long time, and uh, this was our idea for a long time, and to do something like the like the Google Body Browser. But when we first wanted to do it, there wasn't any open source code for doing this. So uh, that was released uh, at the end of last year, and um, so we've kind of uh, been able to incorporate that here, and and um, so that's really exciting. And into the future, you know. Who knows what might happen? We've got a lot of other additional ideas, but given that 3D visualization is a big part of the project, we could imagine this even potentially being a front end for the result of the simulation down the road, although there's a lot of technical challenges we have to solve before going there. But um, if you've seen the nice movies um, that have been produced already, those are based in um, OpenGL um, that are living on a single, on a, on a, on the same desktop. and uh, we thought a lot about being able to stream out so that we could maybe create animations in an environment like this that would be very dynamic. So, um, so we'll see. Of course, there's a lot to do and and a lot of decisions to be made before before we get there. But um, I think it's an exciting first step. And so the, the heavy lifting really was done by Giovanni Matteo for this um, uh, in collaboration with some folks here in San Diego who had pushed forward the uh, the WebGL side. Uh, so thanks to them for doing an amazing job here in the last week. Um, really, yeah. it's a t testament to what, what can happen when we all get together uh, in a single place. OK. Uh, um, so the next big uh, big bit of news, and, and any comments, by the way, you, you have, feel free to either put it in the chat or you know, just say, but um, I'll, I'll take uh, no, no verbal comments as a sign I should move on. Uh, so the next the next thing is that you probably saw in TBox, or if you didn't, uh, good to know. Uh, the project received its first donation uh, in of, of the amount of two hundred fifty dollars uh, in the last week. Uh, this was contributed by someone who, who we met at the meeting, um, who was sure that the project was already extremely well funded um, after after the presentation I gave, and was surprised to learn that in fact it is not funded. <laughs> um, so um, so he didn't even tell, tell us that he was going to donate. We just kind of found this out after the fact, and that was very exciting. So um, obviously now with a donation, we need to go back to 
kind of the budget for the project, um, which I will bring up at the next meeting just to kind of outline the, the, the cost that we have, which have been pretty minimal, really. Um, but uh, anyway, we obviously need to have a process where we decide what to do with those dollars. Um, and also, we have to make sure that we understand how much of those dollars, um, how much overhead for uh, the, the nonprofit um, research institute through which uh, the PayPal account is provided will take. It'll probably be somewhere between 5 and 10%. Um, but uh, anyway, all those, are, all those are things we need to figure out. Probably good to figure out now anyway before we really do a, a full Kickstarter. But anyway, uh, his name is Yates Buckley. Um, I think you saw any, uh, several of you saw an email that I sent to him. If you want to send him additional thank yous, feel free to. Um, and anyway, so I think, but anyway, I think that's exciting. It also shows that we're able to accept donations now, <laughs> which is another important thing, through the website. So um, anyway, thanks to him. Okay, and then the last point before we get to um, some of the sprint stuff is just in terms of timeline. So we did sort of time box release two to happen between last September and April, uh, which is coming up now. So I've um, got the release two plans here kind of colored, color coded um, with kind of a very rough uh, scheme of green, meaning we pretty much did it, yellow meaning we made some starts, but we, didn't, we haven't really completely checked the box. Uh, uh, thankfully, there's no red, uh, which means that we didn't do, which would have meant that we hadn't done anything there. Um, so anyway, I think that it's good for us now to, um, you know, at this meeting, kind of come to a close and do a reflection and reassessment on the last several months of what we called release two to figure out what worked, what didn't work, figure out where progress is to kind of regroup and um, organizationally think about where the project is going to go for an upcoming release three. So um, although I don't think we're ready to do a full reflection on the last few months today, um, I want to bring up the issues so that in the next meeting we can start thinking about um, we can start thinking about the future. And I think it comes at a good time, given that there are some new folks who are interested in potentially contributing their time uh, for us to do this as a, as a joint effort of the folks who you know, are joining us. Uh, because everyone who comes in and is excited to work uh, obviously helps to drive the direction of this. And, uh, for somebody to come in and sign up and say, I want to charge ahead with X uh, means that we should, um, you know, we should add that to the roadmap for, for the future. So that's just a, a preview, I guess, for a larger conversation next time. But uh, basically, we're kind of out of time for release two, so we need to move on to release three. OK. Questions about that? OK. So then. Um, all right, so let's move on to the sprint. Um, and where is it? Okay, so this document here that I'm posting into the chat, and which is also linked uh, under the word sprint 12 review, points to a spreadsheet that you should also all have access to. And that is, is where we basically have collected our tasks. Um, over the last several sprints. If uh, those of you who, are, who haven't seen this before, welcome to uh, click um, to the previous, to the other sheets. We organized this, we've organized the progress for all the different sprints here uh, by different sheets in the spreadsheet. And uh, basically every two weeks when we check in, we just figure out where the status of each one of these different points are. And, uh, and we use that to plan our next bit. Um, now with some of the new folks that are here, um, Let's uh, think a little bit about kind of uh, what the process is. So typically, the process has been that we try to review what has happened in the past two weeks, and then we talk about you know what our plan is for the next two weeks in terms of the sprint. Um, so um, so basically, we we'll go review this list, see what see what got done, see what didn't get done, assess, and then move forward. Um, I guess I did mention to Josh. That maybe we would we would uh, address um, the website thing first. So let me just do a time check with Josh. Josh, are you okay to to hang on till the end, or would you like to make some comments now before we get started with this? I would rather do it now, and then I can decide where I get super lost and decide to drop off. Okay, that's fair. So um, so then let me just sort of um, put the context together. So yeah, so. 
as Josh mentioned, um, I know Josh here in San Diego through um, some of the various activities that I, that I volunteer for here, um, some in the area of entrepreneurship. And, and Josh has a lot of experience shepherding uh, websites who uh, don't know how best to get themselves up in the rankings um, on Google to help, help do that. He does inbound marketing. Uh, um, and uh, we've had a lot of conversations over the last uh, year or so, year and a half since we met, um, about uh, how to do this. Obviously, one of the one of the pieces of, of, of Openworm that's important is that people can find it online. And with the launch of our new website, um, we had a look. And he sort of uh, his hair sort of stood on end for some of the things with regards to SEO. So um, I thought I'd just let him kind of just put make a couple statements about. The website is that was it deliverable for release two, um, and maybe some suggestions for what can and can't be done. Uh, recognizing that actually s several of the folks who built the website are here right now and um, have experience building sites before, but maybe just want to give a couple comments on uh, what you see and what you think um, could be improved. Cool. Well, if I, if I step on anybody's toes, I'm sorry. Um, I know you guys are working really hard on this stuff. Um, so I guess I wrote down some different comments. I guess I, Stephen told me about the project. He said that that they, you guys want to do a Kickstarter. And I, was, I was like, whoa, do you guys rank for your name? He said, oh, we just launched. And I was like, all right. So I kind of I started tracking um, your rankings and looking at the search results from like a, a uncached um, version. In, in, and so right now, like you don't rank in the top 50 for Open Space Worm. And you're thirteenth for open worm, and that's through SEO Moz's software suite, um, which is it's accurate, it's, it's good software. Um, so getting I said if you're gonna like try to do something like Kickstarter, you really gotta make sure you're you're set up for it. And for I know the search results show up a little bit different differently for everybody, but for me, the code.google.com slash p slash open worm is the first thing that shows up in uh, the search results for open worm. Um, so ideally you'd want to be outranking that and it is Google so it, you guys do own openworm.org so eventually you will but um, just making sure that kind of stuff is set up so when you do try to do outreach and marketing someone searches for you they're able to find you and click through. Um, so starting with the site, like the first thing I said to Steven was like, oh, like, you don't really have any text on your actual homepage. It's a splash page. Um, and these look really cool, um, but they're another click that people have to make. So in terms of actually converting uh, to a donation or somebody like accessing the site and finding your browser or some other research that you want them to find, it's just another layer they have to go through. Um, and it's kind of, I wouldn't say it's, it's not the opposite of optimized, but it's very unoptimized because the, the search bots are only reading text and there is no text. Um, and so, and then you go to the home page and I mean, if it was my site, I would add more content about what you guys do in OpenWorm. Um, you guys got news from your blog. But the search engines can't even read this. Um, and I have to look. Uh, it's probably framed in somehow from Tumblr. Is that right? Yes, there's, um, it's, it's using the RSS feed for, from Tumblr. So it's injected dynamically. So yeah, it doesn't get indexed. Since there's no text. Yeah. Um, and so that was another thing I said to Steven. I was like, before you see, I'm imagining you guys are going to get lots of links and press um, and, and different stuff and educational institutions linking to your research and that's really powerful in terms of how you rank online and developing yourself as an authority in, ter in terms of like a search engine perspective. Um, but if you have a blog that is uh, actually on Tumblr's website and you start getting links to your Tumblr blog, that doesn't help your authority. So it's really important to have a blog that's actually in a directory on your website, not in a subdomain, not on a Tumblr, Tumblr site, um, so that when you do start getting links, they're actually linked to your website and they can boost your authority. Uh, and so that's really important. And another thing 
uh, one of the issues with like Tumblr or Blogger um, is that you don't have complete control as you do with like WordPress or Drupal or something like that, or even just like making your own blog if you guys wanted to. Um, but I, like I suggested using WordPress for the blog. It's, it's super simple to use. Um, but like you can't control head data in a lot of those. Um, like they're, they're, I don't, I don't just call them. They're not even complete. They're like semi content management systems, like Blogger, um, because they're web based and Google doesn't want you to be able to change too much. So there, there's certain things that you guys might have to do in the future where you need to change data um, in the header or the footer. Uh, but you can't because you're limited by those platforms that don't give you complete access. Um, so that's that's a reason to switch to something that, that is in an actual directory on the site. Um, so that, those are like some of my main concerns that I talked to Stephen about. That I'm assuming you guys will start blogging and that some of the blog posts might get picked up um, in di from different channels in the neuroscience fields or, or wherever else. Um, so I'm not going to go like super deep into like technical aspects. You guys, I just looked. You guys are missing some data in your head. Um, like it's really there's a there's a tag which is called a uh, rel canonical, and you guys can Google that. Um, and basically, the rel canonical tells the search engine that the page that you're that the rel canonical is pointing to is what the page you are on is about, um, and the reason for it is if you end up with like pages that are duplicates, but you, for some reason you need a duplicate page, you can canonicalize to the old page uh, or to the original page that that you want like Google to recognize that you don't have duplicate content that um, that you do need these two different pages. If that makes sense to you guys. Um, another thing, which I think you guys just the site's just handwritten, right? Right now? It is, yes. Yeah. Um, so I know with like uh, content management systems, this is pretty easy to set up, but doing pretty permalinks is becoming more and more important. And what I mean by that is like if you didn't have this index.html um, pounds in there, and in like if I'm on the showcase page, it's just open worm slash showcase. Um, and that's that's more of a user experience thing than SEO, um, and it's just something I suggest in future to think about. It, it might be hard to do if if it's just written in HTML. There's there's no. Like, it was um, that was the way that it originally was. Then we introduced the splash screen, that is the index, um, uh, and then we had to have a new index. Um, that there is the reason why there is there is a page name in there. You, originally, yes, we wanted to do it like that, but then it, it got more complicated because there was a splash screen, and uh, we had to introduce explicit, explicit names for the pages and stuff. But I, yeah, I, it's a good suggestion. Yeah. So, okay, in, cool. in, in the interest um, of time, in the interest of time, um, so because these are all great suggestions. Um, so if um, so, I took some notes here on a couple of things that you're saying. And maybe it would make sense, um, if you're willing, to, to have a more focused you know, conversation about this, um, maybe just with the subset of the, the website folks as well. Um, also, the, the, the whole source of the site is, uh, is also open source, like everything else. Um, so we can actually look sort of link by link at the, at the HTML content in order to, to make that stuff happen. Um, so is that is that would that be something you'd be willing to do, Josh? Um, do yeah, definitely. Time as well, so, okay. Yeah. Awesome. But I think they're really great suggestions, and I think that the purpose is 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 a good one. I mean, so you're right. We do our this, the openworm.org is is one that we just re recently launched, and it doesn't rank as highly, and we probably want to reduce confusion and noise um, so that people can find it rather easily. Um, and um, so I think there's several strategies we can approach for that. Okay. Thanks. Cool. Awesome. Thanks so much for the for the suggestions, and we'll we'll keep that we'll carry that forward here um, in another session. All right. All right. So let's go now to the spreadsheet, uh, OpenWorm sprint plans, um, and let's start with uh, Andre. 
when last we left you, Andre, you were toiling away at the GPU uh, SPH implementation and um, and working on the performance challenges that you found there. Um, how's that going? Um, I still uh, continue to move in this direction. It's mm, not so simple. Well, uh, last time I told that um, uh, first of all, we have mm, not so fast um, realization of the current version as uh, we uh, expect. Uh, we have here um, necessity to sort uh, all the um, distances between particles and um, to use special uh, hash functions um, to access uh, each particle's uh, neighborhood. Um, but, well, we can, we know that we can expect um, much more um, uh, fast um, performance if we implement um, more optimal uh, algorithm um, for single CPU version. It's obvious how to do it, uh, and um, it was uh, already implemented by me. Uh, but um, for this OpenCL GPU version, um, it needs a lot of um, adaptations and uh, computer um, programming tricks because uh, we are limited with, um, first of all, transfer speed of data between uh, CPU and uh, GPU memory. Uh, which is uh, for global memory quite uh, slow, and this is a bottleneck, uh, one of the bottlenecks of the task, and so on. Um, so during the last period, I have uh, theoretically adopted uh, an algorithm of um, search for each particle's neighborhood. Uh, so. It's expected to be significantly faster than we have right now. And I started to modify existing version, uh, including open cell kernels. Well, right now I'm not uh, ready to show something <laughs> working <laughs> with this uh, new, um, new part uh, implemented, but um, I hope very soon it will uh, work. And um, I plan to show the performance for previous and uh, current uh, new version, so we can compare it by dependence from number of particles and uh, performance. Cool. Like this. So I have a, one comment uh, for you here. So um, by a uh, strange route, I think it involves maybe. Tim pointing me to some conversations on some LinkedIn groups or something, but I've come into contact with a product manager at NVIDIA um, who I pointed the project, I pointed her towards the project, and um, she's curious to hear how we're using Teslas um, in the project, and which is very cool. And we're setting up a chance to, ch uh, to chat about it a uh, little bit later on, let's see, when is it actually scheduled for? for s I don't know, sometime next week. I'll find it. But anyway, um, if that, if it'd be useful to talk, talk to somebody who, uh, I, I don't really know how the conversation's going to go, and I, I also don't know if she can actually help us with, some, with the technical questions about this sort of algorithm that you're running into, um, the, the challenge of paralyzing there. But um, I will... If, um, if there are any questions that you think someone who is a chip designer there at NVIDIA could answer for us, um, you should send them to me. And, um, and if the conversation does turn to be more technical, um, would you want to join me um, on that call so that we can um, maybe get some of those answers? Okay, sounds really great. I think it sure will be very useful.
for faster progress on this. Um, well, maybe I should not set um, to use all um, available NVIDIA uh, software stuff. Uh, about several months ago, I registered at their site uh, as a developer who works with this uh, technology. So this allowed me to download uh, debugger for Visual Studio uh, it's called Perdel Insight um, and a lot of other mm, tools. Um, and during uh, the registration, mm, I was uh, asked, so I filled mm, a number of uh, answered a number of questions. Uh, one of them was um, the project uh, for which um, you plan to use this technology. So I described briefly uh, OpenWorm and told that we are going to uh, run our physics uh, on this. Um, so my mm, uh, proposal was uh, approved, but uh, there was no feedback or interest or interest uh, from uh, their side. And uh, I liked uh, your conversation with them was much more <laughs> much much more feedback. Okay. Okay. Well, well, let me. Well, that's good to know. Yeah, and. Great. I'll, I'll let them know that you're you're registered there and as a as a developer with them, and then maybe we can come at this from from both directions um, in order to maybe get some help. Because uh, I think they're they're really reaching out to the community to see how people are using it in order for them to figure out how to make their products better. So we might be able to to get some help, which would be awesome. Okay, so basically um, you're still in the in the optimization phase with that stuff and. And let's see. And you're not ready to post yet on that one, so we'll we'll slot that one for the next uh, for the next cycle in terms of um, posting your updated example. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Also, I have a I have a note here with the um, the bug on the uh, on the borders of the of the content where. You, you mentioned that um, you could see the edges uh, of groups of particles, and that this was a uh, this was a bit of a bug. Is that something that you um, figured out how to resolve, or is that is that something that you really doesn't make sense to address until after the performance thing? Okay. Okay. Good question. Um. The, yes, the bugs were really significant. Uh, significant. This uh, peaks uh, um, several times higher than um, ordinary usual um, pressure um, in this um, massive of liquid. But uh, well, first of all, we need not. Um, general uh, SPH which corresponds to a very compressible uh, liquid. Uh, we need um, weakly compressible or incompressible SPH which uh, requires to rewrite uh, existing uh, kernels uh, for open cell uh, significantly. So the first uh, stage is Mm, nearest neighborhood uh, search, which um, on which I'm working now, and then mm, uh, I'll need to mm, modify somehow mm, to improve physics calculations, forces, and so on uh, to make our liquid nearly incompre incompressible. And these changes, uh, if they will be uh, done correctly, will um, lead to um, that this uh, bug will be fixed uh, automatically because um, everything will change. 
Okay. I see. Okay, so it's all going to kind of come in the same. same. Yeah, there. So I'll, I'll put that as started. Okay, great. Awesome. Uh, okay, should we move on? Um, maybe we should move to Tim then, because uh, he said uh, he was going to also have to leave, and also Michele has, has dropped off, so we'll, we'll hear from him later. I guess maybe on another thing. But maybe, Tim, it makes sense to uh, get a update from you. Yeah, I've, um, unfortunately, the last couple of weeks since the last sprint, uh, oh. uh, our meeting, we, um, I've been on the road a lot, so can you hear me okay? Yeah, sorry, just a delay. Okay. So, um, I haven't had a chance to do a lot other than a lot of reading, and I've, been, um, I've read probably a dozen papers in the last uh, two weeks, which uh, basically trying to get more detailed uh, as far as gap junctions, and I probably know more about it now than I ever knew um, the Boyle uh, Cohen paper, uh, because that's the one that's got all the uh, formulations and, and the electrical, electrophysical properties of the uh, cells. Um, I'm not sure where we want to go with it other than what we already know as far as how we interact with the, uh, the MDL08 muscle. We, um, we have that program, we have that information so, it, you know, a gap junction works pretty much the same as a, um, a synapse in the sense that uh, these proteins come together in the channel and ions you know, go back and forth. Um, with only single muscle, that's pretty much all you can do. I don't know, we get much more out of it and so we just start um, putting muscles because the muscles are a gap junction together. And um, for lack of a better term, it kind of creates a homeostasis of the whole system when they're all linked together and the ions are flowing back and forth. They, um, they kind of stabilize each other. I've read numerous papers where if you take something out of the equation, either um, the muscles don't work or they just don't... Um, they, 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 they work in a real jerk-like fashion and things like that. So all these ions flowing back and forth and, and the timing of those ions um, is what really kind of matters as far as how the worm articulates its, its movements. Um, so that's, that's what I'm working on. That's what I've been exploring. Uh, also, you know, continuing to look at the no-peptide side. But these, these gap junctions basically are just, when we talk about the UNC9, UNC7 gene expressions, uh, basically what they do is they come together and they couple to create this, this channel which opens up and then the ions flow. So um, that's what I've been researching, that's what I've been doing. I'm not quite sure what you guys would like me to do with all this information. You could give me some heads up. I can focus my direction. Okay. So one thing, Tim, your um, your bandwidth is a little little limited. So I think we're we're getting you a little bit broken up there. I don't know if there's anything that you're if you're running in the background that you can you can kill. But um, just to answer your question, and, um, so that's so that's good. Um, I think that we're still wondering um, if we can get an update on those. Um, slots in the spreadsheet where you filled in the neurotransmitter underscore GJ and um, replaced those with, you know, maybe a, an, an exon identity or something like that so that those guys can um, get, get rolled into the NeuroConstruct project. Um, is, that, is that something that you've had a chance to update? Well, well the, the problem... 
No, yeah, I've been working on that, but the but the problem is these these uh, things work in conjunction with each other, right? It, it, it's not the same as like a neurotransmitter, in the sense that you have multiple proteins working in conjunction with each other that open up the channels for the for the ions. So I'm I'm struggling with. Are other people having trouble hearing Tim? Yeah, could you repeat the last yeah. sentence? Yeah. Yep, I think you're a little you're a little bandwidth limited right now, Tim. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, maybe maybe it'd be best for us to to take this one offline as well. Um, maybe. Yeah. Okay. Well, I, yeah, everybody's breaking up on me too. Yeah. Okay. Let's uh, let's just uh, schedule schedule. Uh, time to talk about this later this uh, week or early next time. Okay, so we'll do that. Um, okay, great. Um, so that's fine. So yeah, so for the for the rest of you guys, so yeah, so we've we've had um, some data that we put in about the neurotransmitters of the connections because that was missing. From the original connectome. Um, we've uh, had a contributor give us some good guesses as to what those neurotransmitters should be. Those have been expressed in a spreadsheet. Uh, um, that spreadsheet has had a Python connector written by Porg, who has put, uh, who's been able to put those inferred neurotransmitters, I believe, into the, into the NeuroConstruct project, if I'm not mistaken. Um, now Tim is looking into the gap junctions, which is obviously another important piece of the puzzle. Um, and they, there's a family of those guys um, that uh, some things are known about, and so we're in the process of integrating that as well um, into, the, into the framework. And uh, exactly the best way to do that, um, because it's a little bit different than the transmitter identities, obviously, I think is, is the question that Tim's having. And Uh, Balash asked a question here about uh, CPU versus GPU. So, right, so good question. Um, so the CPU is a, is a standard processor that's in uh, your computer that does all the operations and the maths that uh, make you... They were breaking up. Uh, you're gone. Am I still here? You are. I can hear you. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Awkward. Okay. Uh, um. I cut up after. Yes. Okay. Let's. Let me try again. And, uh, if I and if, if I break up again, just somebody type it, and I'll I'll let uh, I'll let somebody else answer for me. Okay. So the GPU is graphical processing unit and uh, the big difference processing wise is, is that it uh, it does a lot more in parallel than the GPU. The GPU does everything in sequence, the step one, step two, step three, step four, whereas uh, GPU does step steps one through four in a single operation. Um, and um, the reason it's it's architected differently is because since it was aimed at uh, updating a, a video screen with a lot of pixels uh, very rapidly, it basically and wants to shoot a bunch of pixels and update them all at the, exactly the same time. So traditionally... Okay, the so for just... just yeah. yeah, go ahead. No, I just want to, so just to make it short, so basically CPU more operates as a, it, it calculates things in a serial fashion while GPU is more optimized for parallel operation. Can we right. put it this way? Yeah. Yes. And, okay. And oh, that's we're, okay. and, and because of some economics of GPUs, um, you tend to be able to get a lot faster, a lot more operations out of a GPU than you can out of a CPU. Uh, so we've been writing a lot of stuff for GPUs um, in order to take advantage of it. Okay? Okay, cool. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Great. All right. So what's next? Um, let's see. Well, since we, since we heard from Tim and... Uh, 
since Borg stuff is related to Tim stuff, maybe Borg, you want to you want to update us as well. And uh, and actually, you have a, an exciting update that we uh, we posted a couple of I think some goofy videos on the on the Twitter uh, stream about. But uh, maybe you just want to tell us what what's going on. I, mean, I don't know if you saw the, the Twitter stream, but it's it's. Which, um, oh, yeah, the um, yes. Um, <clears throat> Yeah. Um, okay. So that's again. Uh, the, my main contribution has been to try to get uh, the minimal um, uh, description of the CLT's nervous system into your Um uh, There is, on um, if you search in the Google code, you will find there a neuroconstruct project under the neuromel repository. It's under C elegans, and that neuroconstruct project has taken in the 3D morphologies for all of the cells. What I've done, just to summarize, is uh, add on a leak conductance to each of these cells, um, try to get uh, the export the list of connections from a spreadsheet, which is in the same folder, uh, which contains the list of cells, the list of cells it's connected to, and uh, initial guesses for the um, uh, initial guesses for the um, uh, types of neurotransmitter between them, whether they're gap junctions or uh, glutamate or whatever, and try to incorporate these into the neuromel into the neuroconstruct project. So, it, with this initial rough guesses for all the ion channels and well, actually no ion channels, but um, rough guesses for connections, this can be exported to neuron, and I believe those uh, videos are of the um, cells firing in neuron, uh, all really had been placed and it was a, a constant current at the tip of the, the nose, at the head of the um, worm and through the gap junctions, through the synaptic connections, it travels down through the body and it's a completely unphysiological but it looks pretty, so hence the videos. But um, the whole idea there would be that that's a placeholder for when there is more detail on each of the individual cells electrophysiology, when there is more detail on each of the uh, synapse types, then it can become slightly more realistic. But uh, as a in good initial first step, it does actually run on neuron and it can be, um, yeah, it can be run on neuron to test the basic physiological properties of the cell, of the cells. So this is huge. Um just, just to make sure everybody catches this, so we wanted from the very, very beginning to be able to run the uh, the model on uh, the neuron simulation engine, and we finally did a very you know basic, but it, it worked. And we did an export of that um, while we were there. So I think that's a huge milestone for us um, as a project because if you can't play with the output of the model, obviously it's it's a lot harder to it's a lot harder to understand what's going on. So um, thanks very much uh, to Ford for doing that. Um, one question for you, Porto. I know one of the challenges um, has been just uh, with, with all the number of connections that we're dealing with, it actually um, taxes, I think, the ability to, to do the export. So you've been exporting with fewer than the full complement of, um, of, of connections. Is that, is that something that we can help uh, to optimize? Or, or how, what do you think? What's a good strategy for getting all the connections from the spreadsheet actually into the final, uh, I believe <clears throat> I believe all of the connections are in there, but um, I think there is okay. Well, first of all, they take a little bit longer than they should to run. I think there's about fifteen thousand individual connections, approximately, um, but they take a little bit longer to generate simply because there isn't any detail yet on the specific locations. So, for each of those. Uh, individual connections, it could be searching over 30 presynaptic axon segments and 30 presynaptic dendrite um, sections to try to randomly find a location, um, and that might not necessarily be the closest one. So um, it takes a little bit longer to generate the 15,000 connections. I think, um, Tim, you manually added uh, something like 300 connections or 180 connections initially. And even that one on its own uh, allows you to see the uh, uh, propagation of electrical activity through the worm. So it's a subset of the um, connections that's being generated. I do need to sit down, just look through the um, Neuroconstruct project, 
and um, find out how to optimize it and so on. It is, I mean, if somebody wants to look through the NeuroConstruct project, knows some other NeuroConstruct projects, it could be something that they could spot, but uh, if I had an hour or two at some point, uh, I, could, I could sit down and look through it and hoping to get an hour or two in the next week or two. But I can't make any progress. Okay. That's fine. No, that's awesome. Um, so that makes makes total sense. Um, okay. Great. Um, so anything else? Should we keep going? Any other thoughts, ideas from the last from the last week? You've talked to a lot of people, obviously, as part of the neuromel thing. Um, <coughs> anything that we should have on our horizon with regards to uh, LEMS or neuromel two or suggestions? Um, well, there there is, um, and well, there there were there was at least one meeting where a number of people who were interested in uh, Python APIs for um, morphologies and networks got together, and there has been an Andrew Davidson, uh, who's behind Pine, has um, kicked off um, a repository in GitHub actually um, to gather together some ideas for that, and uh, we're hoping to make that completely neuromel compliant, but also to and there's various packages which will provide a nice clean interface for um, parsing through these morphologies, parsing through networks, um, and also saving them in, for example, HDF5 format, which would be a lot more compact than XML descriptions. Um, it probably isn't an issue for um, the uh, C. elegans connectome. It's probably just enough to fit into XML, but for something like reconstructed canonic Economics, economics data uh, would definitely be a lot handier having this internally in HDF5. So, but all of those initiatives will fit nicely on top of the XML description of the worm and hopefully fit in nicely with uh, NeuroConstruct. Okay, great. All right. Well, uh, um, then let's head over to Alex and. Um, I saw I saw a new commit from you, sir. Uh, I had heard that you had um, I had heard from the grapevine that you were kind of bogged down with finals, but so it looks like that you're that you bounced back. And um, since we do have some other genetic algorithms interested folks here down the line, um, this might be a good time to kind of reengage. So what's new? Yeah, so I just uploaded the last commit. Uh, I found out that uh, my software, which I used for Mercurial, wasn't uh, set up properly, so the repository was a bit abandoned. But I hope that I fixed the issue, and now I will commit more often. Uh, so basically, um, what I've done, I split the simulator into two parts. Uh, the first one, which actually computes the system function, and the other one, and the other one, which uh, uh, simulates the the internal communication itself, uh, and as we as we agreed in the last meeting with you, Stefan, um, I I made a template for for the serialization of the genome. So basically, now it should be easier to to convert the data into XML format. Great. So maybe to provide... Sorry, go ahead. No, that's it. All right, so maybe to provide some context uh, for the rest of the folks, um, uh, it's worth putting up kind of the little roadmap that we came up with for that. Um, so basically, um, this is mainly for Mike as well, um, we wanted to, you know, we wanted to be able to go beyond running a single bit of code that does genetic algorithms over this muscle cell and start to decouple the pieces so that we could run the genetic algorithm runner against neuron and then eventually down the road run the genetic algorithm runner against um, the simulation engine that we're, that we're building ourselves. So this conversation here is part of... Um, the, the steps, the first few steps to do that. And we have a sort of a, a diagram that I will share, that I can um, which just kind of says, you know, what is the simplest possible way that we could imagine doing this? And I suspect 
expect that you'll have more uh, sophisticated ways of doing this, but I just shared it now under under the docs. It's an image called Genetic Algorithm Neuron Runner Python Script Plan, and, and um, so you can have a look at it there. Um, so this very simple version involved writing having NeurML be an, an intermediary where you actually write out to disk. Um, we think obviously that this is not is probably the least efficient possible way to do it, but um, if we can start with that much, just like writing a NeurML representation out um, and then reading it in a neuron, that's at least a way to get started. And, and then we can optimize from there. Ideally, we obviously have these things, we want to have these things connected um, so that you're making modifications to in-memory representations rather than, uh, you know, writing it to disk. Um, but, uh, you know, we, we just wanted something to get started. So, um, so for Alex, Mike, um, you know, when, when I presented on what we had done already and I shared uh, some of the slides that you shared with us, um, he said, hey, I'm doing stuff like this myself um, and I've got some code and does some good stuff. So, um, so he hasn't published it yet and so he may not be able to, to contribute the code to the repository immediately, but um, he might be able to uh, do some running of it on his own and let us know what the results are or might be able to to um, help or augment some of these pieces. I don't know. Maybe, Mike, you just want to make a couple comments as well uh, by, by means of introduction at this point to kind of what you've done so that we can um, figure out how to move forward. So um, that, um, that scheme you put up on Google Docs, that's um, basically the software I've developed. That's basically what it does. So I've developed um, um, Python script essentially, which uses already um, evolutionary computation and libraries which currently exist already to basically um, run neuron simulations, take the output of those simulations, compare them, um, compare them um, with experimental data, sort of the fitness function, do that loads and loads of times, um, run through several generations in order to optimize and optimize your model. Um, I don't know, it's, it's um, <clears throat> kind of tricky to explain without, without sort of drawing a diagram the exact workflow, but if you, if you, um, if you go through what you've written there, so Python calls um, genetic algorithm, um, input file contains the results of simulation plus state of generation plus state of um, gen alg run, uh, that writes the next set, set of parameters to a, to a text file and so on and so forth. Uh, Python calls neuron, neuron writes the data to disk and then that all happens again cycling to and through. Um, so what I've written isn't, isn't quite like that. It's basically that Python sort of controller um, creates it's a Python script which, which can control, can, can run neuron simulations and take the fitness of this simulation, analyze the fitness of the simulation, measure the fitness, do that loads and loads of times, and optimize my fitness that way. Um, so maybe, maybe the best thing would be if we went over separately, because there's quite a lot of technical detail. Um, but yeah, I think, I think the best thing would be, possibly the way to go forward, would be if you if I could have access to the models and the experimental data, then I could try and write some fitness functions before and see how my how my work at the moment does in writing those models. Great. Yeah. So I think um, I think that uh, makes sense to have then a separate working group group with uh, with uh, you and Alex um, and maybe some others who want to join, of course, um, just to kind of go through some more detail. Um, and um, and figure out because so I mean Alex is you know we, we have target we have the target data that he's come up with uh, we actually want better data which is where hopefully Galosh is going to come in um, down the road but um, but um, right now we do have something and so and it's producing results and so we can maybe just start in, in parallel by you if you can run what he's run uh, um, using your system then uh, we'll have something to compare, and then we can see uh, if we can move forward from that point forward. So, um, 
I should say one of the advantages of my framework is because it uses um, pre-existing evolutionary computation li libraries, there's a great deal of, of um, a great deal of flexibility there. If you decide, oh, I don't want to use differential evolution anymore, I want to tweak it this way or tweak it that way, because these libraries currently exist and they're very, very well written. They're developed in the University of Tennessee by a guy called um, Alan Garrett. He, it's a project called XPy. XPy, you know. Um, well, because it uses that framework, there's a great deal of flexibility and you know, it's, you're not tied into doing anything specific as you make in the way. Oh, for some reason you got very quiet there at the end. Oh, sorry. Uh, I have a question. Yeah. Uh, this library you are using is it in Python or? Yeah, it's it's in pure Python, and the reason for that is that when you're doing these genetic algorithms, none of the none of the top level genetic algorithm stuff is actually computationally intensive. The computationally intensive stuff is the is actually just running the simulation. So if you're if you're running the simulations by calling neuron, then all you really all, all your um, all your Python script has to deal with is a string of numbers. It produces a string of a string of numbers corresponding to parameters, so you can call it your chromosome if, if you like. And then from that string of numbers, it gets a corresponding string of numbers, which are just um, the thickness of each of each uh, chromosome. So none of none of this stuff is computationally intensive. So yeah, it's it's written in pure Python. <coughs> could I, could I just mention there, um, as far as the the original Alex's original algorithm is concerned, um, I don't think okay even wearing my NeuroML hacks that uh, converting it into channel ML and converting it uh, saving it in NeuroML format at the intermediate stages is really necessary. I mean, uh, you can have a perfectly good algorithm here which just deals with the neuron um, format. And I mean, at the end of it, uh, you'll obviously want to uh, most likely convert it back into NeuroML, um, but you don't necessarily need to have that as converted back and forth and rely on neuron changing it into its own internal format. I mean, most likely what you'll right, be so doing is Sorry, just uh, trying to uh, a set of conductances that um, uh, are appropriate for the given data set. Right, and and for the first for the first stage, I mean that that could also be fine. So it might not necessarily need to go through there. But in this in this case, um, the interest is that the data model of NeuroML is rather complete and and a rather fairly good standard. And so, if it's possible for us to use to reuse the data model, not necessarily serializing it out to disk, which I as I mentioned is, is fairly inefficient, but to use the data model as the standard then as uh, Giovanni is making the neuronal solver be a generic neuromel data model compliant thing, then we don't have to redo whatever we've done here. But, you know, but there's, there's plenty of practicalities along the way, um, yeah. you know, to, 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 to worry about. So what you're saying would be perfectly fine, but um, does make it a little harder for the future, but, you know. However, we can make. No, I'm, I'm, I would be perfectly happy if I'm just <laughs> using neuronal all the time. That's fine. But I'm, I will freely admit that um, the tool chain uh, for doing this with pure or with uh, Python implementation of neuron, for example, uh, the tool chain itself might be complicated at the moment. Um, incorporating channel ML and neuronal descriptions into it. Um, hopefully, that will be a lot easier with this Python implementation of lib neuronal that a number of people are uh, hoping to work on. Um, so that's, um, yeah, that will definitely become easier in time. So I should say, so my implementation, so my optimization framework is completely divorced in a sense from Neuron. It, all it deals with is a simulator, sort of abstract simulator. It passes it numbers, a string of, um, a string of parameters, and receives back from that, it receives um, uh, trace, a voltage trace, if you like, if you're talking about neurons. Technically, it wouldn't even have to be a voltage trace, but this is, you know, the most likely use scenario. And that's that's the only thing um, my my optimization framework is aware of. So, in terms of um, in terms of neuroML and so forth. Now, in the in this simulation itself, if you want to use neuroML, that's probably a very good idea. 
But in terms of what the genetic algorithm should be aware of, that's probably not a good idea. It's probably best to keep the optimization stuff completely as separate as possible from any, any, implement, any implementation. The simulator should be a black box to the optimizer. Seems reasonable to me. OK. okay. Um, so, so anyway, go ahead. Sorry, I was just wondering, uh, shall I just comment on Tim's question there very quickly? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. OK, yeah, so Tim, you were asking about uh, the relationship to SVML and CellML and so on. Um, for the majority of that, unless you have, at the moment, a, uh, a part of a signaling pathway that in, cell, in SVML that you uh, need to encode or somebody has provided for maybe one of the individual um, uh, cells, then um, that won't really be an issue. Um, NeuroML will cover the scope of almost everything that we can do um, as far as the electrical behavior of the worm is concerned at the moment. Um, you can maybe, you could potentially describe one, uh, a single cell in SBML or CellML, but um, they don't really cover the scope of multicellular uh, simulations, so it's not really, really an issue uh, yet about the interoperability. Um, version 2 will make it a lot easier to interoperate with all of these things. Um, as I say, if you did have a CellML model, that could be converted into something which NeuroML would be able to use. So, um, uh, yes, uh, it, it, it's not really an issue just at the moment. So there is an existing, yeah, so there, there is an existing example that uses SBML um, in through the LEMS framework, um, which might be a good thing to start to play with. Yeah. yeah. OK, great. Um, so Giovanni slash Matteo, if you guys are over there, um, if you guys want to provide additional updates, I think we basically already know what your, your guys' main update is um, from the Worm Browser. But uh, if there's anything else that you guys want to update us on? There's, there's a few things. Um, so, at least from, from me, other than the, the browser, I was working on, um, so we recently switched from JOCL to JavaCL as the bindings for the OpenCL stuff. And there was a problem on ATI AMD cards. I, I have an, an AMD card on my, I have an AMD GPU on my machine and it doesn't run. Uh, JavaCL doesn't run, and I found out that it's related to byte ordering. So I, I did a bit of work around that, uh, mainly when we were in Edinburgh. Um, so basically, I'm working on that. I, tr I tried yesterday, and it does what I've done doesn't seem to solve the, the problem, but I'm talking to the guy who is basically managing the JavaCL stuff, and He's got a few suggestions, so we might be closer to have a real portable kernel. And it, it's not the kernel, it's like the JavaCL binding, so I'm pretty confident we can resolve that, but it's not a, 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 blo a block for, a, for anyone else because it works on NVIDIA cards and it works on Intel CPUs, so that's fine. So that's the only thing that I did other than the Born browser. Matteo, if you, if you want to do that. The, the other thing had been, uh, sorry, for, I wasn't able to join earlier. And uh, the other thing about the Warren Brothers that have been worked on, uh, mainly uh, was in Edinburgh, is um, basically to have an OSGI compliant uh, JavaCL libraries. Now, we already know that that's an issue because that has been recognized by the author of the JavaCL library. And um, anyway, since we have no indication of when that would be fixed, we said that we would have tried to fix it as soon as possible, but like it's already a couple of weeks and uh, it's not fixed yet. And so I try to recompile the, from the sources the jars and kind of fix it myself. Uh, now, I cannot manage to do it since OSGI was resolving the JavaCL libraries, but then there were other issues 
uh, at runtime when the libraries were, when some classes were instantiated and uh, basically I'm not even sure that that's related to OSGI, it could also be related, uh, it could be either from packaging problem or a uh, problem due to the sources that I've been using because we noticed that there are some releases of JavaCL that are not as stable and uh, and what, what I did anyway was like I emailed the guy telling him all the steps I had to take in order to solve the OSGI problem and so hopefully that would have been solving the issue um, but I haven't heard from him since. All right. Okay, so that's fair. So, um, one thing, Stephen. Yes. Just for whoever is not familiar with the OSGI stuff, is basically what we are using to to uh, to to achieve a plugin in the uh, plugin architecture. So when you hear OSGI, it means it will allows us to bundle solvers independently from from the from from the other stuff, but from each other. Yeah, that's useful. Uh, um, and actually, I wanted to kind of get get to the next the next bit here. So, so after having done this this kind of review of the different pieces and parts, although we haven't gone line by line with with the uh, deliverables here, I think we've gotten a basic sense of where, where people are. Um, and as we start moving into the next release, um, I think I, I just kind of want to you know bring Balash back into this conversation because um, as you've been listening here for the last hour and a half. Um, we're a very software-focused group today. Um, yeah, we are I can group. see that. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so, but that, that being said, um, we think that, that what we're doing here is we're building a foundation that um, you know testing is is really crucial for. Um, and um, so, uh, as we're thinking about the next release and, and now kind of taking a step towards thinking about the future, um, we you know we really and benefit from uh, a direction that is focused on, you know, experiments, and that's where that's where you come in um, as the first prospective person who is actually going to, you know, join us um, in this process as well as doing making the basic measurements. And so I think you can really help shape and focus us um, on our deliverables for the next release um, based around the, the pieces that you're doing. Now, for as as, as also a bit of update, so. Um, I've been sending around some emails now to the experimental groups that I'm familiar with, um, main one being the one here at the Salk Institute, um, because there's another piece of software um, that, uh, that is relevant here but isn't on the simulation side, and that's on the worm tracking side. And um, so Balash has, has said that um, he's going to um, be interested in doing some, as a very basic start, to be able to record from the worms um, just movements and be able to translate their behavior into um, some uh, some data sets that we could then use to start doing some validation with. And one of the things necessary is to be able to do the image part, image analysis of a movie to be able to pull out the basic um, shape of the worm and, uh, and then encode it. So um, we found already that there's an open source package out of Genelia Farms here in the United States. Um, that is supposed to en enable that. There's another package that comes from Corey Bargman's lab, who is the sort of the uh, queen mother of C. Elegans experimental research. Yeah, I'm familiar with her work. Yeah, so we might be able to get a hold of that too um, if we ask the right questions. But we'll, we'll see what the maybe if, we'll see if maybe the genetic farms uh, stuff is is a good thing to start with. But but basically, um, we need to start thinking about you know what we can do. To be, um, you know, to, to help, um, you know, Balash in his in his quest to, you know, start answering the question: How good does the model need to be um, for it to really tell us something new about what the worm is, you know, what the worm is up to? So maybe now, Balash, you could just kind of um, discuss a little bit of, about, you know, your plans and, and maybe if you have any questions on what you've seen here so far or any reflections on this. Um, just, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll open it up to you. Okay. So first of all, one question. I can see that there are many software engineers in the group. 
But who is who can tell me a little bit more about the implementation of, 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 of the muscle cells and how the nervous system is being implemented in the simulation? I mean, not necessarily right now, but I have a few questions about those that would help me to shape my ideas. So who is the person who I can bother with, with, with a set of questions regarding the, the muscle cells and how actually neurons are being simulated in the model currently? Um. I know there's probably several of us, but I'm happy to be that person. Okay, you're the best um, person for that. Yeah. All right, I'll, I'll email you, and then you read the questions, and then you decide who is the uh, best person. But okay, getting okay. back to the verification. So, I think sort of essentially what what I would like to do in the long run is to do the uh, Turing test for uh, C. elegansis. So what would be the idea is that we make the video recordings of these worms and we also, uh, well, as you have said, Stephen, earlier that uh, there is a visualization is a big part of the open worm project. And what would be the goal is that if I only give uh, someone only the video recording of the open worm and video recording of the C. elegans, then based on those behavioral data, uh, the two things are indistinguishable from each other. As for a uh, statistical description of the behavior of the worm, I think it's very important to realize that in itself, uh, it's very easy to do. And actually, there are several papers about it. Uh, if you want later this week, I will be able to uh, uh, sort of just get those articles together and put it on the mailing list so people can read them. But what the point is, is that in itself, it's very easy to reproduce the behavior. There are many uh, papers studying it in different environments. Where I see open worm uh, being somewhat different and having much more potential, it is doing it in a biological basis. So if that um, if that behavior is really emerging, then then I think we would have really valuable data set. And I think the reason for that is simply because uh, what's I think missing from many of the computational neuroscience studies is that they only study a, a, a part of the system. But here we would have the uh, basically how the entire organism is working. And I think that's what's really the exciting bit about it. Um, in the last few weeks, I have talked to many people about this. Uh, as I said, I've been to Neta Cohen's lab. She's been very helpful. She's extremely knowledgeable about the worm. I mean, I, I was blown away how much. I mean, practically she knows the worm cell by cell. And there is also uh, Dr. Ryan Hope, who is more on the microbiology side of the things. But he was very useful as well. Um, but getting back uh, to the verification, I think initially uh, for this summer, uh, what I would like to do is just to do the tracking experiments. This is not going to be anything exciting for the open worm. It is for just me to sort of train myself with these, with these experimental techniques. But I think that's what we should really drive for, is that we A, that we can reproduce the behavior of the open worm, and B, we can do it as an emergent phenomenon. I think one of the problems that uh, we will face, definitely, is that with how do you simulate the muscle cells, how do you simulate the body of the worm itself, and how the uh, neural system is working, there are going to be many unknown parameters from it, uh, uh, many unknown parameters in these simulations. It is very, very difficult to record from C. elegans neurons, uh, so there is very little data regarding that. And I, and I think that's, that's one of the main difficulties. And if I'm not mistaken, that there are eight different groups of muscle cells for the C. elegans, and also it's very hard to record electrophysiological things from those cells. So one of the great problems, I think, is that simply we cannot uh, measure many of these things and we face a, a large parameter space. And I think what's going to happen is that we are going to find many parameters which are going to be able to reproduce the behavior statistically. Uh, it, this is just a feeling. I can't give you a scientific argument for why is that going to happen, but I got a feeling in such a big system with so many unknown parameters, sure we're going to find something that is working if you're looking at it from the top level, some from the behavioral side, but those set of parameters may or may not have to do anything with the biology. And uh, uh, the way I'm coming from, I think that should be the goal, that behavior comes from the biology that we are simulating with the worm. So I think, and I talked about it with Ian Hope, and uh, he's going to help me with this. And I know what I'm going to say. It's, it's going to take a long time for the modelers, but I think ultimately we should aim something for like this. But I think what would be really helpful is to uh, simulate mutants as well. 
As you know, the CL against genome has something about uh, 20,000 genes, and there have been identified many mutants that are showing distinct behavior compared to the wild type. And those in the last 10 years, there has been a lot of progress for which, uh, so the motive, the way these mutants are being uh, produced, the way I understand it is that they introduce some random mutations uh, to the worm. They just insert some random genes, uh, uh, change things around, and then they, they do these mass screenings. And while well, some of those worms are not even able to, to, to be alive, I mean, uh, the, their genome is so screwed up that they can't even move. Some of them are going to be longer, shorter, but what are the interesting cases is that there are many worms that are showing different behavior and also microbiologists find out that what is that change within the worm. So there are many of the mutants where we see that it shows different behavior compared to the wild type. But also we know that, uh, let's say, it, it, um, it, it expresses some channel more abundantly than the wild type or some channels are being repressed. And so I think these mutants as being a, a great possibility to prove that the way the behavior emerges for the worm is coming from biology. Because I'm just going to say a number that let's say that we die and hope we can identify 100 different mutants which are having a distinct behavior. And for all of these 100 mutants, we know that what is different from the mutants compared to the normal worm. And then if we program, if we model these differences in the open worm as well, and we can consistently show that consistently what we program to the mutant behavior is, so the, the, the mutant open worm reproduces the behavior of the uh, mutant C. elegans, then I think we would be able to claim it very strongly that it's not just that we reproduce the behavior, but the way the behavior is coming, that's, that's coming uh, from the same, well, it emerges through the same uh, mechanisms as in the biological worm. Because I think if we just take the wild type C. elegans and we just reproduce its behavior, I'm sure it's going to have some interest to the community. But I think if we would be able to do it with mutants, then it would be really a big hit. That's, that's the feeling that I have. And I'm very interested to hear what, what other people have to say about that. Uh, so yeah, that's, that's quickly my, uh, my point of view at the moment. Can I um, say something here? Yeah, please. So um, that seems like a really good idea. The only issue I could see potentially with that is in an ideal world, say, you know, one of your mutants, you've knocked out a particular gene which calls for a particular protein. So, you know, you'd say, if, in, in a, if you're very naive, you'd say, I can, I can um, incorporate that into my model by just knocking out, you know, removing this particular ion channel from my model and expect that the behavior will be the same. But it might not be quite that trivial. It might not be the case that just by knocking out a particular protein, you know, other other gene uh, uh, other genes aren't up upregulated and more protein is made to compensate for that. Okay. So mutants <coughs> it's a good idea, but it might not be quite as simple as, as, as you think it is, because this is something that people have thought about and it turns out to be quite complicated. That's my only comment on that. Yeah, no, I, uh, I am well aware of these problems. And sort of when I told about we die and hope he said he's going to think about that. And, uh, you know, I think this is, this is just an initial idea. I mean, uh, the, I definitely want feedback from you guys. And I think, as I said, I and hope's knowledge is, is going to be a very valuable resource. So I think here really is the key is to trying to identify those cases, those mutant cases, where the situation is is as primitive as I described it, where there is not a whole lot of interactions going on with other genes and where really uh, what we do with the genome is, can be very clearly identified what is the difference in how the neurons are constructed within the worm. If such a mutants exist or not, I'm, I'm not sure. This is, this is where I hope he's going to come into the picture and as soon as he, uh, and as soon as he gets back to me, I'll, I'll let you know, guys. Yeah, this is, this is very good points on both sides. One is that Absolutely, mutants, um, sometimes there's some uh, unexpected compensatory uh, activity that happens, and so you think that you're knocking something out, and, and there's some behavior, and it's more complex. At the same time, I think that Belas's point is also very well taken, which is that um, if you find mutants that are very well characterized and they're kind of simple, and we can narrow down what those mutants are, um, it would be very powerful to be able to show that 
the model has this um, protein to behavior relationship, even if it's just for a few pro a few specific mutants, even if they're simple cases, if we can just show, you know, hey, for these five very basic mutants, you know, we do the same thing in the model and we get the same mutated behavior, that would that would get a lot of attention. Um, that would be huge. So, yeah. but, but but you're absolutely right. We should focus on the ones where we know very clearly exactly what the relationship is to so the best characterized mutants and the ones that are that are simple, so that we don't run into this problem, Mike, that you that you point out. Uh, do other people have thoughts? By the way, Blush, I think you had us at Turing test. Uh, the Turing test for the worm, I think, uh, is a great uh, label to put on this. Uh, <laughs> I think it really captures captures our imaginations uh, for sure. Uh, do other people want to say say something about uh, about that? I think I'm. I, I was thinking the exact same. So I I like everything that Balash is proposing, and I think he gets the spirits the spirit of the project. Um, and I'm very happy to see his enthusiasm as well. Um, the idea of the Turing test for the worm, I think it, it will be great, both in terms of actual value for what we are doing and in terms of publicity for the project. Like, if you start going around saying that everyone knows what the Turing test is, so if you start saying that you have working on, people on the project are working on the Turing test for the worm, that that's going to kind of resonate with a lot of people. Um, so that's a good idea for a number of reasons. And then yes, the it's good marketing. Yeah, <laughs> and we need that too. Although, the, obviously, as long as it makes uh, sense in the project, and it does. So I think that's the kind of stuff we're looking for, and uh, we, we're gonna need that. I mean, obviously, as I, I mean, we we all know that this is not something that will happen overnight. So, uh, obviously, a lot of that stuff will take time. But at the same time. We, we all hope to get there uh, eventually, so I, I'm 100% on board with all that stuff, and I'm aware of the challenges, uh, but I mean, if, if we... Well, I just want to say that uh, I will, I'm planning to sort of, what I was saying, just to write a document about it where everything is a little bit more uh, well articulated and more details about it, and then I'll, I'll pass it along to uh, Stefan and then he can upload it so other people can read it, but uh, with, with more details about this, so it's, it, it's, it's coming, a more detailed version. That sounds good. All right. Yeah, and uh, I will add a very brief comment. Uh, and we, all, we are all aware of, uh, well, first of all, as Giovanni really like very much the, uh, both the Turing test at the end, the second one to base it on a gene description so that basically you have, yeah, we, we're basically making a sort of a <laughs> compiler because you look at genes as software, so you're starting from something which is very well defined and not from some parameters that you just came up with maybe. I uh, like all that very much. And Giovanni is saying, that that won't happen overnight, uh, which I agree with. Uh, the only thing that I want to point out, uh, uh, Stephen, uh, it won't happen overnight, but if we won't plan for it, it won't happen at all. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, and uh, at the moment, none of us has ever even dreamed of looking into generating the model from a gene description. So, something for you to think about. <laughs> mm. I mean, you could, you could replicate, you could have. Um, okay, I'm just saying that none of no, us no, no. has ever gone close to that. No, we're not doing the generation, but you could uh, skip that and say, I have a model for this particular mutant, skipping the generation for. Yeah, but then you're kind of. Genes. I mean, in order to validate uh, that box that you're putting there, you like in order. For that to be valid, you should. I think you should start for something like, uh, given the standard set of genes, I that I have a mapping which makes sense. But because from those, I can get the work. Uh, yeah, otherwise, yeah, so it's, it's, uh, I have a, have a fear. I don't think. I'm sorry, I'm there's a delay. Oh, sorry. I don't know if it's necessarily possible to go from a, a, a direct mapping from a genome to a worm. There's loads of. Um, chicken and egg stuff that happens along, along, along the way and 
it's it's not necessarily the case that you can just say, oh, for this genome, it, there might not be any possible algorithm which says for this genome you get this worm. It may, it, it may be the case that that just throughout the evolutionary history of the worm, there's been all sorts of mechanisms developing to do with protein folding, and so I'm, I'm trying to say that the, the actual structure of the structure of um, the worm itself may may contribute to the way that that genome yeah. gets, in, gets gets. Yeah, I, I completely see that problem, but I think this is. Uh, again, something that we don't need to do this in its entire generality. I think if we can even yeah. identify a few number of mutant worms, I think that's, that, that would be already pretty good. Yeah. And then we can think about the more complicated cases. And, and you know, as, as, as uh, everybody said, this is not going to happen overnight. I think this open worm project is something that we, we might be able to still be doing when we are 60 and 70 at grandpa's. <laughs> But <laughs> you know, there's a lot to do, but it's, it's good science, and, and that's what matters. And we have to sort of like take it one step at a time. And, and, and if we right. can identify those few simple cases, I think that's, that's step one. So yeah, and, and just for, for, for Mateo, so this is a good question in terms of how we imagine potentially implementing this. So for example, one of the mutants that uh, may exist for C. elegans, I don't know who back with this particular one, is one that exists, but there may be one where they've knocked out all glutamate, uh, the, the, the ability to produce glutamate, right? And so in the entire worm, there's there any synapse that uh, has glutamate just doesn't have it anymore. And so what we could do is for these, these, uh, these worms that have papers that have been published that are well characterized to say this is the no glutamate worm, right? Then we can tweak our simulation um, to basically not have glutamate and see if it has that, that same impact. Um, that would be a case where if the behavior comes out and it's similar to what happens in the, in the real world, the way it's characterized, then we wouldn't have to necessarily do a full developmental model, right? We wouldn't have to do all the divisions and all that stuff. We wouldn't have to, like, model the genome explicitly, but we could at least go from ion channel to behavior as a, as a place to start and then fill in some of those other gaps. So this, this project, of course, because it's, it's essentially how do we figure out how to eat an elephant, um, it's a all about us making the right, you know, cutting at the right places and cutting at the right joints and figuring out how to decompose the problem so that we can make some progress that's meaningful without having to, you know, to, to, to you know, build all of life from the atomic level. And so um, I don't think that this is the, the end of that conversation, but I can imagine some ways with a relatively fixed amount of, of uh, computing and software effort that we could do it, uh, do what he's saying. Um, so just, just to... Um, just in case that there were some fears there, um, I think there, that we could put, potentially put it on the slot for for this next release to at least you know move it in that direction. Um, okay, um, Alex, Andre, do you guys have any uh, any any feedback comments uh, on any of this stuff? Just a small question uh, about the different things about the genetic algorithm. Uh, were you able to compile it on Windows? Was I able to, yeah. was I able to compile the code on Windows yet? Yeah, yeah. Uh, the code I put into the Dropbox. Yeah, not yet. Haven't. No. Okay. But, um, okay. but we should do this um, this week and um, actually schedule a time to sit down and do it. Um, Okay. Um, Andre, did you have any feedback as well on this um, Turing test idea? I think you're muted. Yes. Yep. Cool. No, it's good. Yep. Yeah. I don't think that I have um, good ideas right now. Maybe uh, uh, further something will be. So I'll write to a common email um, if I will have something interesting. 
Okay, that's fair. All right, so we'll we'll talk a lot more about this. Okay, so I think now, so we're back. We're we're down to the last five minutes. And thanks everybody for hanging on this long. This was a unusually long meeting, uh, as we had the introductions to make at the beginning. Um, but my proposal to the group is that we um, is that we structure the next meeting differently than the last several um, in the mode of a. Uh, a release planning meeting, and um, which is to both say uh, take the next time to review um, what we've done in the last in the last several months, um, package up pieces that need to be sort of packaged and bundled, insofar as that's possible to do, um, and let's begin the conversation about um, sort of what our priorities are going to look like the ne next time. Um, there's some organizational history. History um, of the way that we've organized ourselves um, that those of you who've been around from the beginning will appreciate, and others, um, you know, uh, who've come in hadn't been haven't been able to see. But uh, some issues about the tools that we've been using, the the, the, the tool chain, for organizing ourselves, and some of the methods for organizing ourselves. Uh, we started with one thing and release one. We've moved to a second and release two. Um, I think that maybe um, although release two has been um, easier for us in terms of a tool perspective. Um, that, that I felt that maybe we could do even a better job of um, kind of keeping track of what we're what we're up to. So um, I think in the next meeting, uh, maybe have some chance to talk about that. But the um, if you guys are all right with it, I think that um, we'll we'll want to talk a bit more expansively about what the next time block is that we can look forward to. Um, sort of maybe in April to September time block. Um, look at some of the meetings that are coming up. I know. But um, by the next meeting, uh, Giovanni and Matteo will have made progress on uh, on work for this GPU uh, neural simulation meeting. So that's that's one thing we want to think about. What we want to present um, at the next year informatics. I know that there's been interest in, in uh, finding a publication out of what we've done already and bundling it up for publication. We started that conversation a few sprints back, and that's we kind of and moved on to some other things. So I think we want to put some scope in for for that uh, um, and figure out how to separate you know, what's happened in the past from what direction we're moving in the future. Um, but I think now will be a good time for us to kind of refresh that conversation and, and, um, and think about the next piece. And also a good chance for us to um, you know, uh, publish informally on the things that we've done more broadly now that we've got this website and um, you know, update the community that's subscribed to the mailing list a bit more. So um, does that seem reasonable to you guys to use that next conversation to discuss release three? Is there anybody who has any concerns about that or questions um, at all? Sorry, can I just add one thing? Uh, so because I'm new to the project, and when I first came to the website, and I know that right now there is a new website up, but for for someone like me who is quite new to neuroscience and doesn't know about software engineering, I think it would be very good to have a document on the website that very explicitly says that what has been done so far. To be honest, I think at, a, at this time it's a little bit confusing. I'm not exactly sure of the few things. And I, can, and I can ask you guys about this, but if someone freshly coming to the website, I think that would be something uh, really useful, something that is more in a more coherent way at one place where you can see that what has been done and, and, and what's coming. Okay. Just a suggestion. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So, and this is, this is always good, good feedback as we, uh, as new people come aboard um, and they uh, are learning the ropes. Uh, we always appreciate people telling us what is uh, clear and what isn't. Um, in our minds, um, this page is supposed to be that. Um, uh, hopefully that results correctly. Uh, this thing which is called, oh no, it didn't. Uh, Oh, that's, oh. Hang on. Um, yeah, that didn't. That's, sorry, that didn't show up. Um, the word uh, uh, The roadmap. Right. So that's what this is supposed to be. Where the slide pre presentation that's linked at the top is uh, intended to be capturing what we have done in, in release one, and as well, I think there's a document link from there which is supposed to say that, and then um, the focus on the muscle cell plus the um, plus the user stories is supposed to be what we're doing this time. But if that's if, um, but what you can help us with is to tell 
us what doesn't meet what you're expecting and how we can make that better um, in the next release. Okay, I'll, um, I'll email you about this. Okay. Okay. Great. So, uh, other other questions about what I was sort of suggesting? Uh, yes. I have a, I have a question. Go on. Giovanni and then Mike. Mike. Go first. Who goes first? Giovanni and then Mike. Okay. Can I ask you again and maybe you say Giovanni and then Mike again? Um, Sorry, there's okay, weird delays. So <laughs> I'm joking. Um, so, regarding to what Balash just said, I agree. I agree. So, that, that's been at the back of my head for a long time. And every time we try to improve it, but it, it is still the case that if someone comes in, it's not clear what, what has been done and what is in the works. So, in our, I mean, obviously, so that, that's great as a reminder, and we should actually do something about it. And um, we've done a lot of work, both with the wiki and the website, the openworm.org. There's a section which is a showcase that, in theory, is supposed to be a snapshot of what has been done. Uh, but maybe we didn't do a good enough job at making it look like that. So we, we, we really need to think about this and have, have something that clearly states this is what we got done so far. And this we this is what we want to do. So the roadmap is supposed to be that, but I think it's difficult to get to the roadmap from, from the web. So if, if you read through the stuff, then you, you will eventually find the roadmap. But uh, we know that that's not the case. If someone is just looking at the thing. Uh, so, yeah, I think we need to, to think about this. And uh, it's, a, it's a great comment. And I just linked there to the showcase article that uh, that uh, Giovanni was mentioning um, on the on the larger facing site. See see what you think about that one. So, Mike. Yeah, quick question. Um, going forward, with regard to sort of communication, um, what's the sort of way that's done? So, I'm for instance, I'm going to be thinking a lot about the optimization side of things. If I if I uh, <coughs> if I have a great idea or I have a question or something, do I just now the whole group, or what's just, what do you generally tend to, tend to do with regards to discussing about this? Different modes of communication, and maybe too many. <laughs> um, so <laughs> one of them. Can you hear me now? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So um, we'll share you we'll share you guys uh, both on um, a tool that we use called Teamx. Although I think in the next release we will uh, consider potentially replacing it. Um, uh, see what folks think about that. Um, maybe in, in in place of that, having just Google uh, Apps accounts um, for the things that Teambox is serving right now, um, as they've just upgraded and kind of changed their interface. I think maybe made it worse. But um, so that's kind of a um, work stream for posting things um, that will get out to everybody. Um, there's also um, you can also just feel free to email everyone. And then um, when I'm saying we're going to have these different working working meetings, those tend to be organized um, via email and then put on the public calendar, which uh, I'll also share with you guys. And then um, and then we meet on Hangout like this uh, to kind of hash things out in real time when when necessary. Um, so I will sign you up to all those things. I should also say for you new guys, um, you know, uh, uh, because this is an open source project, um, you should feel like um, you're enjoying and getting uh, the most value for yourself out of anything that you do here. We try not to place any expectations on what people will or won't do. What we do try to do is we try to get people to commit to what they think they will do for a course of two weeks. Just for planning purposes, um, but that can be as much or as little as you're willing to, to put in on this project. We understand that because it's not funded, you know, we're not, uh, you know, we're not tasking other people to do things that they don't want to do. So, um, so just as a word of, you know, the way that we proceed, um, you, you, we want you to be totally happy about whatever it is that you put in and contribute, um, and um, and not feel like you're obligated. 
uh, to do anything in particular. So. Okay. Any other comments? Everybody seemed generally okay with this whole transitioning to release three thing, wrapping up release two thing. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. When might the next um, sprint session be? Um, plan for two weeks. This same time. Um, does that generally work okay for folks? Yes. Seems good. Okay. Okay. Excellent. And then. Um, I'll, you'll be getting emails on some of these other sub-working sessions. So I'll send an email that involves Mike and Alex for a um, genetic algorithms powwow. Um, sounds like we want to circle with Tim um, on some gap junction stuff. Um, and all of these things will appear on the public Google calendar as well. So any of you who want to drop in on these sessions are welcome to. We'll have them on Hangout. You'll, be, you'll, you'll see when we're up on Hangout. Uh, um, on any of those sessions, so uh, we try to keep those open, um, but not, you know, mandatory or obligatory. Um, so, yeah, we'll try to do those for the next two weeks and be thinking about what we want to get out of the next meeting for a release three planning session. All right. One last comment for Mike. Let's see what typing into the chat window. Also, the stream from this uh, will be available if you want to review it later. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Thanks very much. Thank Bye. Cheers. Bye. Bye. Bye.